Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,289. This week on Cars Yeah, I'm celebrating the Greenwich Concorde Elegance that takes place on May 31st through June 12th. You can learn more at GreenwichConcord.com. I was lucky enough and, and smart enough to, to try it here without Inky, and, and it worked out. So I'd say just, just give it a shot. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from New York City, Ben Clymer. Hey, Ben, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I can't wait. There we go. Ben Clymer is the founder and chief executive officer of Hodenkey, widely considered a leading voice in the watch industry. Ben founded the company in 2008 as a means to write about his passion for wristwatches, a passion that started when he received his grandfather's Omega Speedmaster. Ten years later, Ben has grown Hodenkey into the foremost destination for all things in the world of horology a robust media and retail platform that brings its readers and consumers the best wristwatch content and products in a way that is approachable, authentic, and honest. Ben is an avid photographer, watch collector, and a classic car enthusiast. He's been recognized as part of the Hype Beast 100, Digaday's Changemakers, and Crane's New York's 40 Under 40, while Hoden Key has been named as one of Time's 50 Best Websites and Fast Company's Most Innovative Companies of the Year. Wow. So, Ben, I have told our listeners just a little bit about you before we jump into the questions. Would you take a moment and share a little more about your career and your passion for automobiles and fine watches? Yeah, of course. I I think first and foremost, I think whoever wrote that introduction to me deserves a raise, for sure. Yeah, definitely you (laughs) should give him a raise. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, as we said, I, I began this company about 10 years ago. Really, because frankly, I was I was bored at work. I used to work in finance. Uh, I worked at UBS, a big Swiss bank. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I know that I wanted to be in business, whatever that meant. Mm-hmm. And so I went the traditional kind of white guy route of finance and consulting, uh, at least in the Northeast. Ended up at a job that I just wasn't really too pleased with. And this is when the financial crisis hit in 2008. And I always liked to write. I like to take pictures. I like the internet. I like cars. I like watches. And I combined it all into into a career through you know a, a few good graces and, and some luck. I ended up leaving UBS to, to work on Hodinkee. Uh, I would say part time, you know, almost full time. But I was also doing some freelance writing in the automotive space as well mm-hmm. as for watches, uh, for Forbes, for GQ, for the Financial Times, how to spend it, etc. And then I went back to journalism school, got my master's in journalism, and then kind of went off the races on, on Hodinkee some years later. Well, I love this. I love your story. I love your website too, by the way. Uh, being a designer, people that take the time to do things right and clean and crisp and nice. And it really, to me, represents the brand and what you're doing. And when I originally found you, uh, I just enjoyed the site because of the cool watches. And I went, Oh, this guy's kind of into cars too. I think I need to talk to him. And, and of course, then when I found out you're involved with the Greenwich Concours, I went, Ah, this is a perfect opportunity. So we're going to talk more about you and watches and cars as we continue on your life's journey. But first, I always like to start with a success quote or a mantra. This is some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. It's a really nice way to get those inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So Ben, take the wheel. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there, there's one piece of advice that I could give anybody, and it's one that, that was given to me, is pretty much me in, in a nutshell, and that is just just give it a shot. And I think there's one thing, you know, I had this this kind of entrepreneurial ambition and even ideas for businesses as, as long back as I can remember. But in, in the world that I grew up in, which is, you know, just a, a standard kind of like upper middle class, middle class family in, in Rochester, New York, the idea of being an entrepreneur didn't really exist. You know, and so I think the idea of just trying something and if it doesn't work out, you know, no harm, no foul, you move on and try something else. Uh, and had I had the, the confidence or the, the wherewithal to try something even earlier, I think Hodinkee could have started even earlier or another business could have started even earlier. Uh, and I think that, that that's kind of half the battle is I know so many wonderfully creative people here in New York. I mean, I've got these amazing ideas, but they're just afraid to try it. And I think, you know, again, I was I was lucky enough and, and smart enough to, to try it here with Odinky and, and it worked out. So I'd say just just give it a shot. Well, I love that. And it's what Cars yeah is all about, inspiring automotive enthusiasts. In your case, we'll add the word a watches, timepieces in there, of course. But yeah, so many people ask, well, when should I try my idea? And I said, you should have tried it yesterday. 
Uh, you know, get, just start it somehow. Even if you can't afford to do it full time now, do it in all that spare time that you'd spend wasting on front of a television or uh, doing whatever you're doing, going out with friends at night. You've got a lot of hours there to build on something. And I'm really happy that you found your passion and found a way to wrap it into a career. This is fantastic. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit here and talk about a story that instigated your personal passion for cars. Is there a pivotal moment in your life and you knew that you were indeed a car guy? Yeah, it goes back to really early days. And, you know, I was probably five or six and my parents played for me the seminal film Herbie the Love Bug. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, but truly, I mean, that, that was my favorite film growing up. And I, I loved Herbie, of course, for, for many reasons. Uh, so the Beatle was something that just, it, I was just drawn to it. And actually, I mentioned somewhere else recently, I was actually a Volkswagen Beetle for Halloween one year. You were, you were actually a Beetle for Halloween. That's I, cool. I truly was. And, <laughs> and my mother, my mother made me, love her dearly, she made me a Volkswagen Beetle costume. Obviously, those were wow. not. So she made me, I don't know if it was cardboard or, or paper or something, but like a, you know, a, a full length, full body length uh, Volkswagen Beetle Halloween costume. What she forgot uh, to consider was that I would need to go up and down stairs. Uh, so, <laughs> so I couldn't bend my knees. So I kind of had to walk <laughs> up and down stairs. But, uh, so the, the, Volk, the Volkswagen Beetle was, was kind of it. You know, that was what, what got me going in, into cars as a very, very young guy. And then kind of went on, went, went on from there. You know, I love your mom already. That's just a classic thing a mom would do. I always wanted a Porsche when I was young. And every birthday I would ask for a Porsche. My mom would laugh. And one year she made a cake in the shape of a Porsche. Uh, so she said, now you can have your cake and eat it too. Of course, that classic, that classic line. Yeah, my, my movie, which dates me, I'm a little older than you, is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Sure. So, uh, but yeah, when Herbie the Love Bug came out, that was great. I remember going to see that with my family. Well, let's take a look at some of these roads you've driven down, walking around like Frankenstein at Halloween. <laughs> Paints a wonderful picture. But I'd love for you to share a big challenge or even a big failure that you faced along the way and define it as a learning moment, something that really defined you, that helped push you through to a higher plane. Tell us how that experience helped you gain even more momentum as you move forward in your career and your business in your life. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest thing, the, the seminal moment in me in my career pre Hodinkee was really, it was a financial crisis. Uh, I had a wonderful consulting job uh, at a small firm here in New York called Aquis Consulting Group. We work with Pfizer and you know, these really great companies. I was two years out of college and, you know, the, there's this kind of two-year itch where, where young, you know, kind of ambitious folks say, you know what, even if you like the job, which I did, I really loved it. I just said I wanted to try something else. So I left there without a, without a, a job. And I said, oh, I'm going to try to start something. And I kind of, you know, messed around and, and played with these ideas and really thought that I could do something with this idea that I, I could always get a job in finance again if I wanted it. And so I did that after you know, three or four months of, of really not being employed and really just kind of hanging out in coffee shops for a little while. <laughs> uh, I ended up working for UBS, which was, you know, still is a big Swiss bank. And that was a really formative experience for me because it told me the it really defined what I didn't want out of life. For, for so long and for so many years, really my, my adolescence, you know, since my adolescence, I thought finance was kind of the cool thing. And it's hard to believe now, but, you know, what, when I was in my 20s, like the way that entrepreneurs are revered now, bankers were revered back then. And so, you know, the, the coolest job you could have in the world was to work for Goldman Sachs. You know, that was yep. that was the holy grail. And I realized very quickly, you know, I didn't work for Goldman. I worked for Free EBS, which is a, a competitor in some ways. But either way, you know, I just saw the people that worked there. I saw their lifestyle. I saw what the actual job was. And I said, this is not where I want to be at all. But I, I didn't, you know, and again, this was kind of right place, right time. But I didn't really know how to get out. And so the, the idea of starting Hodinkee while at, uh, you know, while working full time was really a, a trying experience for me. And then also going through the experience of the financial crisis while at UBS. I mean, I saw people being laid off by the by the dozen, truly. Yeah. Uh, and so that was a really kind of formative experience for me. And I didn't like the way that that the, that the company was treating people. I didn't like the way some managers were treating people. Certainly how low level employees were treated was was really dismal. And so, you know, I just said this is the exact opposite. It's the antithesis of what I want out of life. I want to work for myself. Uh, you know, working for UBS has who knows how many thousands of employees. And it really just taught me what I didn't want. And I think knowing what you don't want is just as, just as powerful as, as knowing exactly what you want. You know, you hit on a really important thing here. So many people get into a position, a job, especially with a big company like that, where they think there's this sense of security. Even if they're not happy with the situation or looking around how may, perhaps people are treated, um, how would you advise somebody who's maybe younger, could be older, but usually it's a younger person that finds himself in that position. They always have that little inkling that they want to go do something, but 
oh, I shouldn't go do that. I'm, I'm Maybe I'm not prepared to do it yet, or I, I, I'll fail. I should stay here because this is so safe. Well, we all saw how safe those big companies were when everything melted down. There was no security there at all. And many times they really don't care much about you anyway, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I saw that firsthand. I mean, there, there's some really kind of horrific stories that, that I could share, which I won't just just out of, you know, out of respect for my former employer. But, you know, it's one of those things where you really have to to understand who you are. And I think that's something that, that I've always been conscious of is I, I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. You know, and, and, and I mean that in a very literal sense is I know I'm a, a decent writer. I'm not I'm not Edgar Allan Poe. You know, I, I can write, but I'm not that. I know I'm a good photographer, but I'm not Ansel Adams. You know, I know that I'm good at a few things. And I'm great at, at certain other things. And then you also need to know what you're not good at, you know. And so I think the idea of trying something but being real with yourself is is really important. And I said, hey, with Odinky, like, I know that I can that I care about watches much more than all the other folks out there right now. This is what I love. And I truly did love it at the time. I still do. And so I said, look, I'm not the best writer. I don't know the most. But I think I love it more than almost anybody. And by the way, I like the Internet a lot, you know. And so I started using these digital tools. We was using Tumblr and Squarespace and all these other great platforms back then when nobody else even knew what they were. And also, by the way, I think my my kind of my ignorance towards what the watch industry is really helped me in that I didn't know what a publicist was. I didn't know what a marketing manager was. I didn't know there was a press trip. I didn't know anything about this. I just said, look, I'm going to write about what I like. And I went for it. And I think taking a stance and having your own kind of vision on, on something is really what is going to define businesses of the future. It's not about being everything to everyone anymore. It's picking a side and going with it. And that's what we did with Odinky. We said, we like these types of watches, not those types of watches. And by the way, we're only going to talk about watches. And, you know, 10 years ago, nobody ever would have guessed you could make a real business out of just talking about watches. Right. But here we are, you know. Here we go. I want to yeah. uh, have you share, where did the name come from? Because it's so unique. And when I first saw your site and I went, Okay, everything's great here, but what is what is this name all about? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a completely valid question. So, you know, as I said, Hodinkee never, I never thought it was going to be a business. I thought it was for fun. You know, I, I did it because it was bored at work. And uh, I Googled, I've done this in the past, whenever I wanted to start a business, I would translate a meaningful word into, you know, go into Bobblefish or Google Translate and translate that word. And so Hodinkee with a Y on the end means wristwatch in check of all things. Ah, and, and so I said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to Googleize it. I'm going to put a double vowel in there and, and go with it. But again, it's one of those things like, you know, there's so many of these like momentary you know calls that you make every day and none of them ever really turn out to mean anything. Turns out this one did. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it had, a, had I known that Hodinkee was going to be this giant company down the road, would I have given it more thought? Maybe. But, you know, I have no regrets about it at all. And I think the name Hodinkee really says a lot about who we are and that we are covering incredibly expensive, sometimes pretentious, or at least could be pretentious things. And we don't take ourselves too seriously. You know, we are just, I'm from Rochester, New York. I'm, you know, both my parents were teachers. Everybody that, that works with me are just normal people. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no privilege here. And I think with a name like Odinky, it kind of resets the stage as to what the conversation might be about these really high-end luxury objects. I like it. Thank you. That's awesome. I love it. Well, let's have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special vehicle and maybe share a memory you have about that ride. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, where, where to begin? There, there's, there's not so many, but there's a few. I mean, my first vehicle, which I, which I love dearly to this day, was a Volvo 240DL station wagon, uh -huh. uh, which was my, my dad's old car that he gave to me in, in high school. Yep. Uh, that, that was just a great thing. Uh, and then after that, I had an Audi uh, A4 through college, which was just a, a great little thing. But I would oh, say yeah. the, first, the first really special car, the first car that I was really proud to buy myself, was a 1962 Porsche 356 Super. Oh. Nice. Yeah. So that that was a meaningful car for me. And I, I knew I wanted to do it. And I didn't really know anything about it short of that. I mean, the, the 356 and the Beetle obviously are directly connected. So it made sense that I would go for 356. And I bought this car and I couldn't afford it. I financed it. You know, it's probably a $35,000 car. I think I put, you know, maybe $7,000 down and financed the rest. Uh -huh. And I, I had no regrets. You know, I just I just love this thing. I barely knew how to drive stick. I basically taught myself how to drive stick on that car. And it was just a really, really special moment for me to kind of say, like, hey, like, you made it. Like, this is the life that you've wanted to lead, and, and now you can do it with, with this car. And, and, and I love that car for sure. I love those cars. I have a TV show now, uh, Cars Yeah TV, and uh, sure. the show that's coming on actually uh, next week as we record this, so I'm about five weeks ahead of myself here, but is a trip I took to a, a guy shop in Long Beach, uh, John Wilhoyt. John, oh yeah, you know John. Okay, yeah. yeah Everybody who cars right now. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. He's uh, he does some incredible cars. I've known him. I bought a car from him about seventeen years ago, and uh, love the three fifty sixes. They've become quite pricey though, like some fine watches, right? 
They have, you know, the, and the, you know, uh, this will, I think, come up in a question later. But you know, I, I, I ended up selling the car for considerably more than than I paid for, which was great. You know, okay. I didn't really do much to it. I kept it, I maintained it well, but just the, the you know, the ascension of the price was organic. Uh, yeah, th- those cars have gotten really rather expensive. I still think they, they, you know, there's a lot of them out there. First of all, so I don't know if they'll ever get super, super high unless we're talking about Carreras or the early ones. But you know, I, I had a B, and I think the Bs and the Cs are wonderful cars. They, they really are. Yeah, well, it's kind of the end of that era before the 911s came in. So they'd they'd gotten things about as good as they could get with that cars. But um, exactly. I've got a big smile on my face that you had one of those. How about seller's remorse? Is there a yeah. vehicle you wish you'd never let go? Well, the the two cars that I mentioned, I mean, the, the Volvo 240DL, just because that was my childhood. You know, that was my first car. I took my driver's test in it, and, you know, several first romantic moments in it, you know, just kind of like. <laughs> It was, it was high school, you know, it was your childhood and Volvos are still, I have so much, you know, regard for them today, uh, even the new product. And I wish I had kept that car. I don't know where it is anymore. It's it probably had a hundred thousand miles on it when I owned it. And that was over 20 years ago. Yep. So I wish I had that. And of course, I mean, even more than that in some way would be the Porsche, you know, the, the green Porsche was such a great car. Uh, it was my first classic. I now have a handful of classics and that is just a reliable, easy thing to drive. And, you know, it never gave me any heartache at all. It just worked, um, you know, not very fast, but you don't care. You know, it's more fun than you have in, in newer cars going much, much faster. Yep. And so the, the, the green 356 would be a car that I wish I still had. No doubt, for sure. Well, I would love for you to share what has you excited and fired up about your business right now. Hood and Key, uh, tell our listeners uh, who haven't experienced your site what they can experience when they go there and, and what has you so excited about it. And what are all the different kinds of things that you do and offer your customers, your viewers? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, Hodinki is this weird combination. I shouldn't say weird. It's just a wonderful combination of <laughs> uh, media and commerce, so content and commerce. We began as a media site, and I went to journalism school, and you know, I really believe in the power of, of media. And we offer beautiful you know, original photography, beautifully written word stories about high-end watches, so mechanical watches in many cases, uh, sometimes quartz. We also do a wonderful video series on YouTube where we talk to very well-known collectors from ranging from John Mayer, the musician, to J.J. Reddick, the basketball player, to Mario Andretti, for example. Uh, you know, we talk to these guys about their watch collections. And so those it's called Talking Watches. That is probably our flagship digital product. And we do this for free. We just find these guys out there and say, hey, you like watches? Let's talk about it. So we do that similar to, to the style of this, this podcast. Yes. Uh, where we just say, hey guys, like, tell me, tell me what your watch collection's like. And so that's been a great success. Uh, we do a print magazine, the Hodinkee magazine, which is really beautiful. Uh, covers, uh, covers watches and cars for those interested. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on, we have a podcast as well. Uh, and then the other thing that we do on the flip side of the business. So everything I've mentioned so far is media based. We have a, a, a content. I'm sorry. We have a commerce store. So basically we have a, a fully authorized retailer of over 11 high-end watch brands, including Tag Heuer and Zenith and and some really wonderful brands like that. And you can buy them online, which, believe it or not, is a totally foreign concept. So most high-end watches today are sold through mom-and-pop stores in, in, you know, your local jewelry store, whatever. Mm -hmm. We are among the first, you know, Mr. Porter being the other one, we are among the first authorized dealers to be allowed to sell watches online in the world. Uh, And so it's it's a pretty exciting place to be. Uh, and we said, hey, you know, we can we can make this experience better. There are so many people that love watches out there. We've helped kind of build even more of them. And they just want their experience to be easy and fun. You can buy watches or straps or accessories or anything for the watch world uh, related uh, on the Hodinkee shop. That's shop.hodinkee.com. And you can pay with Apple Pay. And that means you can pay with your face, basically. Uh, and, you know, the, the item will be at your door the very next day if you buy a watch. We do free to insured shipping. We do, you know, really curated mixture of products. We do a lot of content around it. It's really a fun way to explore the watch world. And it's been it's been an amazing thing to to see. And I think in terms of what I'm most excited about is just to see that grow. And then this year, we're actually opening up our first permanent retail location. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah. So later this year, probably end of the year, if not early next year, we'll have uh, two floors in Soho, all about watches and cars and cameras and, and cool stuff. So that, that's what probably what I'm most excited about. You know, this is absolutely thrilling, and I love the way this thing created itself, not itself, because it was a lot of hard work, of course, but the fact that you started as putting free content out there for people, and it built credibility, I would assume, because for someone to spend uh, a small fortune or a midsize or large fortune on a watch, they need to have confidence of who they're buying for, and that's one of the scary things about buying watches online, uh, is like, well, am I really going to get the real thing, and who are these people? And you've already established all that, so I'm, I'm very excited 
very proud of what you've built there. It's really fantastic. Thank you. It, it, it means a lot. And I think that that's exactly it is, you know, the, this idea of buying expensive things online, you don't know who you're buying it from. Now you do. I mean, we are, we are the name in, in watches for sure on the media side. Yes. And, and this wasn't something that came from us. It frankly came from our consumers. And they said, look, we trust you guys. We know you guys will do this right. We want to buy our watches from you. You know, you're the, you're the experts. Why don't you do this in a way that, that other people can't? And so that's exactly what we've done. And, uh, and so far, so good. Let me ask you this, because of uh, my personal experience, I always loved watches. I've had some nice watches in my life. And, you know, my uh, father-in-law, we lost him about eight years ago, and he had a, a glycine airman that he bought sure. when he was serving in Vietnam. And it was a watch that my wife always remembers her dad shaking his wrist all the time. Sure. And when she was little, and she was like, one day she said, Dad, why are you always shaking your wrist? Is something wrong? And he goes, yeah. no, I'm winding my watch. Yeah. She's like, what? And she learned about automatic watches. Well, when we lost him, uh, she took his watch and gave that watch to our son. Oh, and okay. he was in uh, college, I believe, at the time. And so he never had a watch. He just wasn't interested because he grew up where he had a, a smartphone. They had a watch or a clock on it, timepiece on it, I guess. You wouldn't call it a timepiece. But let me ask you this. With, with all of us carrying around these devices that have time on them, has the watch industry changed at all or has it become more special to have something around your wrist that has meaning? Well, I, I think you just nailed it. I, I think, you know, to answer the first question, yes, it has changed and it has gotten smaller, it has retracted. But the folks that we've lost and the kind of products that we've lost were, were never about the emotion anyway. They were utilitarian. They were there to, to literally act as a clock. They were there to tell you your time, mm -hmm. which you can now see on the laptop that I'm looking at or my iPhone to my left. And that, that was never what, what our website was about. Our website was about those special handcrafted things that will last for generations, like your father-in-law's watch. You know, And that is the wonderful thing about these things is – there is almost nothing, even a car, I dare to say, that that can last as many generations as, as carefree as, as a watch. And by the way, you can put a watch and wear it and have it with you every day of your life for your entire life. Yes. Not, not something you can do with a car, of course. And so the, the industry has changed completely, uh, but I, I think for the better. So now we're, we're, we're kind of honoring the, these objects for, for what they are, which is kind of emotional talisman and emotional kind of keys that, that people can hold for, for multiple generations. So we're celebrating them instead of just using them, which is what watches were over the past one. Well, for car guys and car gals, we love mechanical things. So watches are a perfect fit. I'm seeing that with, for instance, Sports Car Market Magazine now has a little section, every magazine about a collectible watch something of historic nature. And of course, watches have great ties to the sporting world. You mentioned tag. Uh, when first year of my marriage, I've been married 35 years now, my wife bought me a tag that I could wear when I was surfing that had an expandable metal band to fit around my wetsuit so I could see it so I could get home on time. I think that's why she really bought it for me. Sure. <laughs> so I could get home on time and help with the kids when they were little. But uh, And then our, I think it was our 25th wedding anniversary, she bought me a GMT uh, huh. Master II. Um, uh, because it's kind of was the next version of that old tag because the tag has a very small face, uh, on it. So yeah, they're, they're memories of moments in time and they're everlasting. So, uh, I, I love to hear that. It's great. Let me, before we jump to the next question, I'd love to ask about your involvement with the 24th annual Greenwich Concord Elegance, this spectacular event we're honoring this week. How are you involved with the event? Yeah, so Hodinkee is a sponsor. The Hodinkee shop is a sponsor. So we'll have a booth set up there with lots of cool watches and, and neat things to look at. Watches, straps, accessories. You can see our magazine, et cetera. That'll be there. And then for the third year in a row, I'll be a participant. So I, uh, I'll i be showing a car there. Nice. Uh, I, showed, I showed one last year and the year before. And, you know, I, I live in New York City, so Greenwich is right up the road. I keep my cars in Bedford, New York, which is really right next door to Greenwich. You know, it's just it's a wonderful concourse. And, and, and Mary and then the guys over there do such a great job. And, you know, New York is a special special market and that is New York. Yep. And there's really you, you'd be surprised at what kind of, you know, kind of comes out of the woodworks for, for the Greenwich show. You know, it, it's not Pebble Beach, but I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think it's it's so much smaller and more intimate. But you see these really heavy hitter cars come out. It's such a such a great show. So we're we're a proud supporter for the second year, and uh, I'm a participant. For oh, fantastic! Well, I know they appreciate your support and being in their 24th year. And I had Mary Winterstrom on the show here, and her history and her parents' in laws' history with the show goes back so far. So I think it's fantastic. Well, Ben, up next is the last lap before we put the pedal to the metal. Let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors that make this show possible. Hey, fellow automotive enthusiasts, you know I'm a huge fan of Covercraft. I've protected my vehicles with their products since 1975. That's right, all the way back to my high school days. 
Want to keep your vehicle's exterior and interior looking new? It's easy with a Covercraft car cover. A car cover is the best way to keep your vehicle looking great for years to come. Car covers protect your paint from fallout, birds, dust, rain, insects, and pollen. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. I use my Covercraft car covers every single day. Right now, you can get 10% off all Covercraft custom car covers or their ready-fit car covers. Plus, they offer you over 15 quality fabrics to choose from. Their spring sale is from April 15th through June 16th, 2019. Order direct at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com. That's Covercraft.com. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Hey, Mark Green here from the Cars Yeah podcast. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? That's right. Cars Yeah is now on MAV TV. I visit some of the past Cars Yeah guests and take you along for the ride. Go to MavTV.com to learn more where you can enjoy Cars Yeah TV. Mav TV is also available on DirecTV, Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through MavTV.com online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. All right, Ben, we are back, and I have a bit of an introspective question. If you woke up tomorrow and you were manifested into a vehicle, what kind of car would Ben be and why? Oh, man, that, that's a really that's a <laughs> difficult question. Uh, you know, there, there, there's the car that I'd love to be, and I, I can tell you that the car that I would love to be would, uh, would be a probably a Ferrari 250 Zagato. Oh, uh, So yes. I'm, a, I'm something of a Zagato guy in that I've got one or two of them. And I just think there's something so romantic and so kind of like beautiful and, and kind of like lustful about a Zagato body car. And then, of course, Ferrari is Ferrari. So, you know, the, the idea of taking, you know, a 12 cylinder, you know, kind of Colombo Ferrari and giving it to Zagato is such a special thing. There's so few of them out there. They're so beautiful. The car right below that or right next to that would be, of course, uh, the Aston Martin DB4 Zagato. Oh, uh, yeah. Which I think is, you know, I mean, we're talking about. 10 to $20 million cars here. At um, least, yeah. At least, exactly. But these are these are such special things. And the way that they're, they're made is so different than the way that even Aston Martins or Ferraris are, are made today. Uh, so I, I'm a huge Zagato fan. And so so something from from that kind of design, you know, ethos would, would definitely be would be where I am. Well, I think it makes sense with your passion for fine-made uh, wristwatches and, and watches and things like that. Kind of, kind of fits. Zagato is another one. Oh, yeah, I love those. Some incredible, incredible designs came out of that studio, for sure. Ah, nice. Well, Ben, we are entering the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of the Zagato throttle. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? Find a good mechanic. (laughs) Uh, Yes, especially with an old car. And with an old wristwatch, find a good jeweler who can take good care. Yeah, that watch, for sure. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? Yeah, I, I think often assuming that I'm wrong. And I, I think listening to other people has been one of my one of my greatest strengths, my greatest assets is that even when I was young uh, and starting out Hodinkee, the first thing I would say when I would meet somebody new in the watch world, say, you know, I would love to know what you know. I, I, I don't know anything yet. I, I want to, to kind of take it all in. And then, of course, I make my own decisions based on, 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 on the, the information that I'm gathering. But I think Assuming that you know more than everybody else is, is is a quick way to kind of not make it, you know. Well, yeah, and you become a little bit of an annoyance to other people too when you're <laughs> so <laughs> uppity, right? Yeah. But uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, Stephen Covey's book, "The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People." My favorite habit is the fifth habit, and that is first listen to understand before speaking to be understood. So, exactly. very well done. Now, how about a resource? There are so many. Of course, your side with Inky is a incredible resource for find watches is there another resource you'd like to share with our listeners today yeah i mean you know no business affiliation at all but i, I i'm a avid user uh both petrolicious who i think does great content uh, yes. and of course uh classicdriver.com uh, 
And so, you know, as, as a classic car enthusiast, a uh, classic driver is for sure the number one resource for, for finding classic cars. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not actively buying and selling cars, but I'd like to be, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and classic driver just, just has everything you, you, you can, you could ask for. And I think, you know, I use Haggerty a lot and I use, you know, other websites here and there. But the fact that Classic Driver, you know, has, has a heavy European slant, I think is really wonderful because so many of the great classics that I'm looking for exist in Europe. Yes, uh, yes. And so I've never bought a car off of there, but I have found cars that I would like to buy off there. Definitely. Oh, yeah. So, big fan <laughs> of Classic Driver for sure. Me as well. Now, if I could wave my magic wand and arrange for you to sit down and have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would that be? I mean, that, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think Enzo is, is, is right up there for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how, how could he not be? Uh, and just the way that he was able, and I, I think of, of the Ferrari brand often. I'm, I'm not, I don't own a Ferrari, but I have such admiration for what they've done and that they built this amazing kind of formula, you know, race program, you know, one of the best in the world. And they also are able to create a, Consumer product, if you can call it that, even though it's a little outside the normal consumer price range, <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that is, you know, has such a brand equity. And then you talk about what that brand means to people. And it's, just, it's a little bit like Rolex in some ways, where it's like, when you think of a sports car, if you don't think of Porsche, you think of Ferrari. And the fact that they've been able to, to do that and create products that are so strong for so many years, as well as have a true race team or a true racing team and, and a successful one of that is just amazing. And then also have the brand equity. To say, hey, you know, 10 year old kid on the street in New Jersey, do you know what a Ferrari is? And he probably does. Yeah. And I think as, as we build out our own brand, we want to be able to appeal to the, the real enthusiasts, the guys that, you know, in, in other words, would be like the Formula One Ferrari guys. You know, that's the real watch enthusiasts. We want to appeal to those guys. We want to appeal to the guys that would be buying, say, uh, you know, a new Omega or something like that, which would be the guys equivalent to, to buying a, you know, a 488 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you also want to appeal to guys that, that aren't buying anything. They just, just, you know, really would love to be part of of our brand. And the Ferrari has that, you know, Ferrari has so many people that just want to be part of that world. And I really admire the way that Ferrari has been built into having these three tiers of, of, uh, of audiences. And that, that's really a a special thing. So, so Enzo would, would, would be the guy there for sure. Most definitely. Absolutely. Now, how about a book? Is there a book that you'd like to share with our listeners that you share, you learned a lot from or you just enjoyed? Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's not so much a book, but there, there's a gentleman who's actually a doctor that I'm a big fan of. His name is Peter Atia. Uh, so Peter Atia is uh, kind of a longevity doctor. So he kind of thinks about how, how you know, humans can live longer. But he's also a very serious car and racing enthusiast. Uh, and he's just a wonderful guy. He's got a great podcast, a uh, big Art and Senna uh, fan. And he's, his, his kind of learnings and his teachings have been something that have, have been really helpful to me just in terms of maintaining health. Uh, so he's somebody I would definitely kind of have, have a look at. Would you spell his last name for our listeners so they can find him? Yep. So his name is Dr. Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A. Awesome. Great. I'm going to look him up. I think he'd be a good guy I should be talking with. So Definitely. nicely done. Well, listeners, you can find these links on Ben's very own show notes page on the Cars yeah website. Just go to CarsYeah.com, type in Ben Climber, C-L-Y-M-E-R, and that page will pop right up. All right, Ben, we're up to the checkered flag. And this last question, it can be a bit of a doozy. Today, I'm going to buy you any cool collector car in the world. Doesn't matter who owns it, where it is, even if it's up north there from you, that that guy, uh, he makes the shirts with the ponies on him. Ralph is, I think, yeah, his name. Sure. He's got yeah. a few nice cars in his garage. Last time he's I looked, okay. I think he's doing okay. Yeah. I think I paid for some of those with all those polo pony shirts that I bought over the years. I don't even play polo. Can't even say polo. Uh, but today, I'm going to buy you a very cool car. But there's a couple rules to this game. One is, You can sell it to buy a bunch of other watches or cars with. That little trick's off the table. So if you pick the GTO Ferrari, you got to hang on to it. Wouldn't be a bad deal. You have to drive it. No garage queens allowed here. But I have a feeling you're a guy that likes to use the things that he has. They don't just sit in boxes and collect dust. And here's the kicker. It's the only collector car you can park in your garage. So choose wisely, my friend. Interesting. You know, I I think it would. there's a very specific Alfa Romeo, Giulia, Sprint Speciale, that was owned by a guy named Briggs Cunningham. Uh, uh, so you might know who Briggs is. You know, he oh, was yeah. a yeah, exactly. So so Briggs had, and it's it's not really a well known car. I love Alfa Romeo. I have two of them now. Uh, the Sprint Speciale is such a crazy looking car. It, uh, th- those engines are so reliable. Uh, so it would be the Sprint Speciale owned by Briggs Cunningham uh, because I love the connection to. He was a big watch guy as well. I love the connection to the Northeast. You know, he was right up the road here in Connecticut. Um, I love the connection to watches and to cars and what he kind of represented. You know, as as a watch guy in this space, you know, you realize how kind of 
how European centric the whole world is. So to be an American, is, you really are an outsider. And Briggs in many ways was an outsider when he went at Le Mans and, and many other you know, kind of arenas. And so the, the, the Alfa Romeo Sprint Speciale owned by Briggs Cunningham would be the car that I would love to have uh, and be my only car for a long time. Is that uh, the silver car? It's it's kind of an off silver. It's a little gray. bit darker. Yeah. Yes. Kind of, yes. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. It sold it at Gooding some years ago, and I'm not sure where it is now. And you know, I wasn't really capable of, of buying a car like that back then, for sure. But that's a car I would love to have, for sure. It's beautiful. Those cars, to me, they're they're like little rocket ships. Or they are. Yeah, they're just spectacular. And one of your uh, colleagues there sent me a picture of you sitting in a kind of a purple reddish kind of it looks like an older. Uh, Alpha is that? Yep. Is that one of yep. those cars? So that that's that's an Alfa Romeo uh, Sprint Zagato. So that's Zagato, a Zagato, uh, of course. Yes. Uh, so you know, same similar chassis, etc. Uh, but that's a Zagato bodied Alpha that that I have, and I'll actually be showing that car at, at Greenwich this year. Nice, awesome. Well, Ben, you've taken us on a great ride today. I've really enjoyed getting to know you better. I'm so happy that you've been on the show. I want to thank you for sharing your really incredibly fun journey. Would you uh, offer us a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you drive off in the sunset in Briggs Old Alpha? <laughs> sure, I would say. As, as I said earlier in the show, just give it a shot. Give it a go and see what happens. I, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Absolutely. And again, what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about you and your business? Sure. Uh, just visit us at hodinke.com. That's H-O-D-I-N-K-E-E.com. I would encourage you listeners to follow uh, what Ben is doing. You can subscribe and he sends you, I mean, these are the emails you want to get. They're just beautifully done. They're fantastic. And the great thing about Hodinki and what Ben and his team are doing is you can learn so much. I mean, I've caught myself spending probably way too much time reading your articles when I should be working and recording <laughs> shows. But I, I learn every time you send me something. And I love the relationship also with like when you had Mario on your show. Uh, sure. and share. So I would encourage you listeners to go there, subscribe. So it just automatically comes to your inbox. I think you're going to really love what Ben has to share with you. And also you can learn more about the event he'll be at the GreenwichConcord.com at GreenwichConcord.com. And a shout out to Mary Winterstrom for connecting a Ben with me today so that I could bring him to the Cars Yeah listeners. Ben, thanks for being so generous with your time, your expertise, and for sharing your many experiences with me and the Cars Yeah audience. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you. I'll see you. At the Greenwich Concorde Elegance. Thank you, sir. So much fun. You're welcome. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimball.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPIC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!